Idag förlänger vi vår sändning på webben därför att Lotte Knut som kommer hit och tipsar om reselitteratur. Och det är så många böcker så vi valde att fortsätta efter sändningen på nätet. Var med och lyssna på Lotte Knutsson. Nu ska jag prata om en underbar roman som heter Hattis liv. Och den här hamnade från början som manus i Oprah Winfrey's händer. Hon kunde inte sova, hon bara läste hela natten. Morgonen därpå så ringde hon upp debutanten som trodde att det var någon som skojade med henne. Det kunde väl ändå inte vara Oprah Winfrey som ringde. Men det var det. Och tack vare detta så har den här boken fått stor spridning. Den heter Hattis liv och den är en mor och en mormor beskriven ur tolv olika olika berättelser. Så här ser den ut och jag träffade författaren Ayanna Mattis. Welcome Ayanna Mattis who uh, has come out with a book in Swedish and it's about a woman and we are uh, we can uh, see her life through her 12 different children mm. which is such a interesting way of writing about one person <laughs> uh, the 12 tribes of hattie hattie is the mother mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's also interesting how this book came out to be so well known i have to start with that <laughs> because it's about the similar kind of program as this mm -hmm. one Mm -hmm. Oprah Winfrey. Yes, correct. She read uh, the manuscript. Yeah, I she think. read a galley, basically. Same sort of same thing. Yeah, yeah. And she really loved it from the first first page. Yeah. <laughs> and she called you up. She did call me. <laughs> and where were you then? I was in Paris. I was on vacation. Yeah. It was a. It was. A, it's a very mysterious process. No one knows when she has a reading partner and they make a choice. Um, about the book and then there's a books editor for her magazine and they're the only ones who know so no one on my end knew not my editor not my publisher nobody you don't but you, you think it's a joke when she called I did think it was a joke <laughs> I was they told me that someone from her magazine was going to call but the books editor from the magazine mm -hmm. because they wanted to do a review so that's who I was expecting mm -hmm. to call so when mm -hmm. you know the phone rang and then this voice said This is Oprah Winfrey, and I, what I said was, no, it isn't. And then we, we sort of went through this back and forth. No, it isn't. Yes, it is. No, it isn't. Yes, is it, it is. a joke? I think it's exactly, yeah. exactly. And then you realized it's it was really Oprah Winfrey, yeah. and she really loved your book. Yeah, yeah, it was really. How did, did that feel? Because you have had some uh, in doubts about sure. would this be a book or not? Yeah, of course, of course. It, well, in the it was interesting. The, the funny part of it is that I didn't realize that she was calling to tell me that she had chosen it for the book club and I was saying to someone a little earlier today that it was funny because as we were talking we'd been on the phone for maybe 15 minutes already and I kept thinking well you know she is such a busy woman I can't believe she just calls people <laughs> to tell them she likes their book I mean that's amazing you know? um, but of course she was calling to tell mm -hmm. me uh, about that it was I mean it was really gratifying mm -hmm. I think um, and very very surprising mm -hmm. I've been very fortunate because I have a very good publishing house in the US and they had been the book was already we had It had a publishing a publication date it was supposed to be January of 2013 so by the time this phone call happened in October things were already feeling really um, really good you know mm -hmm. I was really pleased and, and surprised about the book's mm -hmm. prospects and and the life that it might have had and then this happened and mm -hmm. it really was very surreal and uh, now it's history it's 200,000 in English around that I think and, yeah, and now it's up in count. Swedish but it's a fantastic story and the th I understand Oprah because she started to read when before she went to bed and <laughs> I did the same thing and you're right in the story uh, it starts with uh, a 15 year old girl yes which is Hattie mm -hmm. and she's uh, leaving uh, Georgia mm -hmm. where she grew up and she was born there in the, uh, the year is around 1920 mm -hmm. correct and she's in a railway station with her mother and mm -hmm. you kind of lose her mother there for a moment yeah and then she she sees something mm. which really changed her Life, sort of. Yeah, yeah. Well, in a can way. you explain that scene? Sure. Uh, so, as you said, she leaves Georgia, and and of course, we're in, this is the 1920s. It's 1923 when she leaves. She's 15. She's and, black. And she's black. Yes, Which so is important. Very important. In exactly. This story. Otherwise, the rest of this doesn't make much sense. But um, so she's she's black. She's it's 1923. So this is well before, obviously, the civil rights movement, which wasn't going to happen until the 1960s. So we're 40 years before that, and we're in a period. Um, 
in the United States in the South, which, which was called the Jim Crow period, which were a system of laws of racial segregation. Um, and there was a great deal of racial violence in the South at that point. Hattie and her mother and sisters leave Georgia, in fact, because her father has been, has been murdered mm -hmm. um, by white men down in, in the South, in Georgia, where they come from. So they sort of leave under great duress, you know, sort of un it very early, kind of pre-dawn, they sneak away from their house and they get on a train and they come north to Philadelphia. And when they get there, they get to this train station, and it is, it's a big bustling city. Uh, so that's also a thing she's not used to. She's from a more kind of rural area. They are, um, her family was a, a sort of a middle class family in, in the South, and, um, but when they get there to the North, their fortunes change. But at any rate, she's in this train station, and it's very bustling, tons of people, and she walks outside. She gets separated from her mothers and sisters in this crowd, and she walks outside, and there's a flower vendor, you know, sort of a flower vendor cart. And a, a black woman walks up to, that she doesn't know, she's watched, Hattie is watching this scene. A black woman walks up to the cart and um, gets to pay for some flowers that she's getting. And she upsets the cart and she knocks flowers mm -hmm. and vases everywhere. And so Hattie is holding her breath because the flower vendor is white and the woman is black. And in the South where she had come from, something very likely very violent would have happened mm. because of that incident. But instead what happens is that the woman, you know, apologizes for having knocked over these flowers, pays for her flowers and moves on, which of course to us seems like the most normal thing in mm. the world. But to Hattie, what is, she is shocked by the absence of violence mm -hmm. because it is inevitable that there would have been violence had this happened mm -hmm. in Georgia. And she says, I would, ne I and would she says never, she'll never, never go, go back. back. Yeah. And then she starts her life in uh, Philadelphia mm. and she, she meets, she thinks it's love, but yeah, uh, it turns out to be so and so with that marriage. <laughs> <laughs> I think there is love. In the beginning. I think all through. Okay. Oh. But, it, but it's very difficult. <laughs> it's very difficult. It's very they, are difficult. Very, they are really struggling. Mm -hmm. She's only 17 when she gave birth to twins. Yes. And this is so moving because the twins also, uh, she gives them names mm -hmm. that she's very proud of and she knew that her mother would never, ever right. uh, like it or right. accept it. Right. Right. What, what are their names? The twins are called Philadelphia and Jubilee. Mm -hmm. So she essentially gives them um, very symbolic names yeah. almost, you know, and she's, I mean, she's a young girl. Mm -hmm. And so she gives them names that embody all of the hope that she, mm -hmm. she has for them. And also names that, in, to her mind, are very new. You know, mm -hmm. it's a new era, a new mm -hmm. generation. Her mother has, uh, has passed on yeah. by the time she's pregnant and naming these twins and her mother would have thought her that you know her mother as i said they're a very middle class family in the south uh, with a lot of propriety oh. and very kind of you know so her mother would have disapproved and thought mm. these names were sort of showy and too you know and, and it starts out and you think when you i thought at least when i read it that this is going to be symbolic with these two twins mm -hmm. and they will start a new life mm -hmm. a new chapter in the history mm. but it turns out to be very very difficult Indeed. because they get sick Indeed. and she's struggling so hard Indeed. to get them to survive mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. By herself, 17 yeah. years old. Yeah, yeah. Her, um, she thinks they have pneumonia, and again, you know, sort of can't stress enough the times, right? Because now, well, still babies with pneumonia, it's, it's not the mm. best situation, you know? But now we have met penicillin in hospitals mm. and all this kind of stuff. So they, Hattie and her husband, whose name is August, didn't have any money. Um, and we're also at the very beginning of penicillin, not quite mm. penicillin yet. So the fact that these children have pneumonia is really a pretty serious situation. She basically uh, locks herself in a bathroom with the babies mm. and she keeps turning on the hot water mm. because she's trying to give them a steam cure mm. to help them to breathe. And it's a really very harrowing situation, mm. made more harrowing by the fact that if we remember at those times, it, you know, it wasn't like you just turned on the hot water faucet and the hot water just came on forever and ever. There was a cold stove down in the basement that had to keep being loaded in order to produce this hot water. So it's a really mm. very tense, very difficult, very sad eventually mm. kind of moment. And it's sad because they die. It is, it is And indeed. they die because of this. And, and then they are still in the story all the time because mm -hmm. she kind of carries them inside of Certainly her. Certainly she does, yeah. And that affects the other children because mm -hmm. she gives birth to a lot of other children. Yes, she does. She Twelve does. altogether, or the children. Twelve, yeah. Well, eleven. She has, uh, and one grandchild. Yes. yes. So okay. she has, she has nine more children, and then she ends up sort of taking care of a mm. grandchild toward the end of the novel. Mm. But it is, you know, when those, when the the babies die, it is, of course, it 
it means something on two levels. First, of course, is on the sort of personal level of Hattie as, mm -hmm. as a woman and as a mother. She, her, it's not that she doesn't love the other children. She's a difficult woman, certainly, mm -hmm. in, in many ways. She's very difficult. But, and she loves her other children enormously. They are everything mm -hmm. to her. And they love but, her and in they a love complicated her too. It's way. Just, it's very complicated. Yeah. But what has happened when her twins die is that I think she, what she experiences is an, an inability to show affection, mm -hmm. an, ability, an inability to show tenderness mm -hmm. in some ways. So there's a great deal of love, but there's not much kissing and hugging mm -hmm. and cuddles and that kind but of thing. But at the same time, when you follow one of the, if you can, you follow, sort of follow all of them, yes. and they, uh, through this, their own stories, you get the picture of Hattie. Exactly. And they call her all the time, although they are grown up, and yeah. they call her in the middle of the night, yeah. the son Floyd, for instance. And, yes. And they all do because they have this yeah. kind of. Uh, I know uh, they are tied up with her. They sort are. Of. Well, she's a very she's a larger than life figure. Mm -hmm. I mean, she and she is because she is so so stoic and because she is so unknowable in mm -hmm. many ways, and but also because she's so tough mm -hmm. and so private that they, in many ways, her children don't know her. She doesn't really let them know mm -hmm. her, but she takes care mm -hmm. of them, of course. And she's just a huge sort of looming figure in their in their lives. And the, the children's lives, we're calling them children, but of course we generally mm -hmm. don't meet them when they're children. They're usually adults in the book when we meet them. Each chapter sort of, mm -hmm. you know, is yes. named after one and is from that particular person's perspective. But they, I mean, their lives are incredibly varied. There's a jazz musician named Floyd, for example. There's another young man who's fighting Vietnam in Vietnam when we meet him and that story takes place in 1969 and they're in various situations mm -hmm. yes there's a there's a there's a, a boy who's Astrid. a sort of a child mm -hmm. preacher uh, named his name is six and so the stories that they, the chapters are, are vastly different in terms mm -hmm. of the circumstances mm -hmm. in which each child finds himself mm -hmm. but Hattie is still very very present in each chapter mm -hmm. and very very present in the lives of her children mm -hmm. and, it, and it was interesting I, I, I think because she's so complicated, it was almost necessary to write the book in that way. It's a strange structure, mm -hmm. but it was very necessary because she's so complicated and so large. And in many ways, her life is so difficult that to have written her in a more conventional way, with a, in, in a more conventionally structured novel, I don't think it would have worked. I think the best way to understand her was always through the prism and lens of her children's experience mm. of her. But it's, it's, a, it's a great way of, of describing a person because, mm. of course, it is like that. Yeah, of course. Depending yeah. where you stand from what Certainly. point of view you, you see a person, it's, it's a different picture. Certainly. Yeah. Have you met her in your own life? I've met, I've met my grandmother. Um, came from the South, not from Georgia. Mm -hmm. She came from Virginia to Philadelphia in the early part of the 20th century. So she, and she had a lot of children, not as many children as Hattie does. Mm -hmm. She had a lot of children. But she, she's very different than Hattie. I think in some ways my grandmother, she had that same kind of um, quiet stoicism. But she's very different than Hattie. You know, Hattie is kind of an angry woman in many ways. Mm -hmm. You know, she's a little bit, this isn't a word, but I, I always say she's a little ragey. Mm -hmm. um, but she, um, so my own grandmother wasn't like her, but I think that I was um, curious enough about who my grandmother was sort of unknowable in that way, that I, that I tried to kind of imagine who she could have been. Um, but in many ways, she, Hattie, is entirely uh, her own person. She's an entirely um, sort of independent mm -hmm. creation, Like I a think. queen. She is, the family. she is a flawed one, but a queen. <laughs> yeah. It's a fantastic book. I'm so glad you came here. And uh, just to show, it's not only Oprah Winfrey's Toni Morrison, uh, mm. another great mm. writer that I know you admire very much, that Enormous. says that she's so moved by, by this yes, novel. I've been very fortunate. Yeah. I hope the Swedish, um, your Swedish audience will read this uh, because it's part of the US history, really. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for coming here. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Mm, en väldigt stark berättelse som heter boken heter Hattis liv.